Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's about three minutes after the hour. We've got over 120 people signed in right now, so I think we can start. Uh, so if, if Dr. Espinosa has the slides and advances, I think we're ready. Or if, uh, Matt. So I'd just like to say at the onset, um, we're delighted to have you here. We're really excited to talk about this project, which has been a, a great team effort. Um, I wanted to provide just a little bit of background of the biobank. The biobank uh, collected the samples that went to the COVID dome that, uh, that Joaquin will talk about later. I'll talk for a few minutes and flip things over to Joaquin Espinosa who'll go through really the uh, the background of the, of the COVID dome and then give you some additional information. So it should be very uh, nice and interactive and so forth. So we think back to March timeframe, that is when we started the COVID biobank. And again, we're going through some uncharted territory with some uncertainty again now, but at that time, if you can remember, things were rapidly changing. It be became apparent to me and to others that there were many groups, in fact, a number of groups were all applying for IRB applications to essentially try to gather samples from the same limited number of patients. There were a, a good number of groups that had interest uh, and it just didn't seem possible or really practical to try to have everybody gather on the same group of patients to gather these samples. Now, there are several pandemic dynamics going on at that time, and, and frankly, they've kicked back in the last several weeks. There are logistical challenges in this time to actually having access to patients. So I've done a lot of clinical research, but it's always been sort of a face-to-face -face interaction. That in many cases was not possible. There were shortages of PPE, which the research team would have needed to use if we could do things a standard way. There were logistics around the, the strain of the healthcare system, uh, those taking care of these patients and so forth. So we endeavored to do something differently than we normally do, and that is to have an institutional, single institutional uh, biobank uh, for this effort, and for all, all those reasons I outlined uh, above. So we did initiate the COVID biobank. We looked at both uh, prospective patients, those we, whom we could identify acutely, we could reach, we could consent and gather samples all during that uh, interaction. There's a limited number of those, 100 to 150. It was, then we also went after retrospective uh, samples. So these are discarded samples under a waiver of consent. Now it's clear that the real-time samples, so if we could identify someone in the hospital, consent them remotely, um, then gather the sample when they were there and time it, we could do a lot of additional analyses that really aren't practical or possible on the retrospective. So PBMC isolation and a number of other things. So next slide, please. This is a schematic. This was done by Audrey von Bachhoven, who's led the biorepository effort. I appreciate him letting me use the slides. You can see we partnered with both UC Health and Children's Hospital in a way that uh, we can get pediatric and adult samples. I think that makes this collection somewhat unique or more novel. Uh, we had prospective samples and retrospective. They all went to the biorepository. There was a labeling and naming convention in place. Those that could be processed more extensively for immunological reasons went to HIMSR, the shared resource then did the isolation and so forth that I mentioned before, went back to the, the biobank. Encore, our clinical trials management system was used to link these then to clinical data. We've been working with Health Data Compass, uh, again, to have a richness of data around these clinically. Also mentioned that we had a steering and allocation committee. I very much appreciate that group stepping into the fray to help with this. And then we've been endeavoring to give uh, samples out to the research community. And I'll say uh, very prominently that it became clear to us that many of the same groups, we looked at these applications, wanted to do the same analyses on the same patient the same way. So that's in conversations with uh, Joaquin Espinosa, we, we really kept this idea of the COVID dome. We could do a central process and evaluation that could be used by, by all researchers, not having to replicate that. So next slide, please. Just again, want to recognize the efforts of the Tissue Allocation Committee. Eva Greg is currently uh, chairing this and, and providing outstanding leadership to this group. I would note this group, I think initially met twice a week as we try to go through these requests and uh, optimize the system. We continue to meet, meet on a regular basis. And I, I do appreciate the special effort that this group has put forward to uh, help guide this process and uh, scientifically uh, allocate these samples. Next slide, please. So here's a snapshot of the, of the samples that are in the biorepository. And again, as a priority, we have worked to supply samples to the COVID dome, which we believe uh, can benefit the largest number of people in a central way. Again, there's about 150 prospective participants, both from the Children's uh, Hospital and the Adult Hospital. 
There's more than 3,000 in retrospective, so those in whom we've we've obtained discarded samples that we can uh, utilize in that manner. We've got a lot of nasal swabs. There's a lot more than 2,500. So one of the things that's been a challenge is, do we just collect all these and try to uh, bring them in the bank? How selective can we be? We've got more selective over time. We have RNA, DNA, whole blood plasma, serum, urine, even some FFPE. So there's a large collection there. Just looked recently from the biobank, we've given out 3,500 or so uh, unique samples that have been distributed. Again, many of those have gone to the Covidome, but to other groups around campus too. I would just say this too, there are some groups we haven't been able to satisfy their or fulfill their requests. And the, the two main reasons for that is we simply don't have the samples. Some have been very large. We don't have enough cataloged into Encore. The other thing that's been challenging is there's a very specific patient characteristic that one is looking for. That takes additional work uh, with Health at a Compass. I think that we end our clinical data where, where, warehouse. Uh, but for those for those sample uh, requests that are simpler in nature, want this many of this sample, positive or negative, and so forth, uh, those are able to be fulfilled at a, in a, at a quicker rate. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lister. Always a little concerning because you can't encompass everything that's happened. Um, many, many, many people jumped in to quickly activate this complex endeavor to collect samples at this time and then to get samples out to researchers. I thank all of the people and individual and groups listed here. And there's others, of course, that we, we haven't sure captured. Next, next slide, please. We just like to make these two sites uh, in your bring these to your awareness. The first is the COVID-19 Biobank website. There's lots of good information. Uh, Matt Steinbeis is on this call and made those uh, initial comments uh, as, as noted. There's also a red cap link uh, request to request samples. And, and again, I think the challenge has been those samples which we simply don't have the, the right tissue or samples and those that have more complex clinical needs. The simpler samples are much easier for us to, to fill earlier. So with that, I wish to turn things over to Joaquin Espinosa, who's really done a great job. I just said a personal note, it's been a real pleasure partnering with him so directly as we had this initial idea, we looked at the great work he'd done with the Trisome Explorer. We frankly, to save time, used a lot of the framework and the approach that he had used in that and brought it over to, to the covid owned project. Uh, again, it's been a delight, appreciate all of his efforts. Joaquin, take it away. Thank you, Tom. How's my Spanglish coming through? You sound great. Right. Sounds great. great, thank you. Great, so it is truly a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share with the community today the work of the COVID-19 um, to craft this multidimensional data set, data set to accelerate translation and research in COVID-19 through collaborative analysis. And I'm speaking today on behalf of a large number of team members that I'll be, some of which I'll be, some of whom I'll be introducing in a minute. So first of all, big kudos to you, Tom, uh, for setting up this biobank and, and, and for identifying the COVID on as a top priority project. We in the COVID on team are fully aware of the political cost of having to identify one team to do a lot of centralized analysis versus splitting those samples in multiple ways to satisfy individual teams. But I hope that within the next half an hour or so, we'll be able to illustrate how, how the choice was wise. And now we have created a very unique resource for the community. So big kudos to you and your team, Tom. Um, first of all, uh, I wanna acknowledge all the amazing team members, starting with the co-investigators listed here in alphabetical order. Um, every one of those individuals is working uh, extra time you know, to, be, to do COVID research. We don't have a COVID on grant. We don't have uh, a lot of any uh, funding um, for COVID research, but every one of these individuals, when I approach them, uh, we're more than happy uh, to, to run into the, the building on fire that is COVID-19 and, and make a difference. Uh, Tell Bennett um, in charge of our clinical data procurement, Angelo in charge of all the metabolomics, Matthew Goldbraith running uh, the data coordinating center, Kirk in charge of all the mass spec proteomics, Elena running all the uh, site of uh, mass cytometry new mapping, King Jordan, at the hints are doing all kinds of things from, of course, very, being very involved in the processing of the samples, but also analysis of samples with MSD assays. Andrew Monty uh, helping us also understand and make sense of the clinical data. Seth entails team, key personnel um, procuring the data, um, clinical data. And Kelly, along with Matt, uh, these are, you know, I cannot say enough good things about the, these two uh, characters running the data coordinating center. Uh, very few people in town who can master so many different omics data sets. 
by these two individuals do. Uh, I want to thank again the Biobank Steering Committee for identifying this project as a top priority project for the use of the prospective samples. Thank you, Marcia, Peter, Brian, Allison, Eva, Matthew, Audrey, and Martin. Very much appreciated. Uh, big kudos, big kudos to the biorepository and sample processing team. Audrey, of course, running the biorepository, going out of his way, you know, to make a difference in this time of need. Jill leading the HIMSER as well, making the HIMSER available for BL2 processing. And then these various um, individuals uh, down here in charge of various aspects of the processing these samples, Paula, Ross, Zach, Kim, Jody, Jennifer, Anna, Keith, big special um, shout out to Keith Smith, the manager of the Human Trison Project Biobank that very quickly reacted in this time of need to apply some of the same approaches um, to the uh, COVID on samples. I mentioned this already, but I want to I wanna include here, of course, the Health Data Compass as a key partner in procuring and making sense of that uh, clinical data. Again, Tel and Seth have been leading that effort with guidance from Andrew as well. Uh, the, we have a multi-omics analysis team led by Matthew and Kelly. Cole, another top player in that team. This, this gentleman have been working super, super hard over the last few months to uh, annotate, curate all the omics data sets that I'll present today and also make discoveries with them. But then as I'll explain in a moment, each omics data set has one or more experts um, that, that cure that data before it goes into the data coordinated center, Paula and Ryan on the side of, side of things, uh, Francesca and Angelo on metabolomics, Monica on um, mass spectroteomics, Fabia also metabolomics, Tushar on the side of, side of things, Kirk of course on everything proteomics, Julie on metabolomics, Elena on site of, Kim on everything MSD based, and Keith you know, also helping with analysis of um, the metadata for all those samples. And then last but not least, you know, an amazing group of, of uh, collaborators who we brought into, into uh, this type of business a couple of years ago for the development of the Trisome Explorer and who quickly responded you know, in time, time of need to create the COVID-19 Explorer that we'll share with you in a few minutes. Kyle, thank you, Kyle, for putting out with me and the endless iterations of the various experts and for Nick and Michael to, for all the support and the belief um, in this course. Uh, now, there are many, many more people that should be acknowledged, but uh, I could spend a full hour just doing so. So if I haven't mentioned you, please be aware of my gratitude. And also I say, we don't have any funding specific to the COVID project, but all of the individuals that you saw in those slides, you know, we are leveraging resources funding from other agencies, including these NIH institutes on top, a venture grant to Elena, first grants to my team, some funds from the chancellor office. You will see that we have employed the HR3 resources pretty heavily. Um, everything that we do here at the Cynic Institute is supported in one way or another by the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, then and Georgia and C Foundation. The LIDA Hill Foundation provided funds for the Biobank, and then the Cynic Institute and Mesoscale Discovery uh, Company also provided in kind resources. So let's jump straight into it. I think it's obvious by now. COVID-19 is a very heterogeneous medical condition, observing only a fraction of individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2. It affects primarily the lung, but also other organs as the disease progresses, such as the heart, the kidney, the liver, among others, and involves dysregulation of myriad physiological processes, including immune dysregulation and abnormal blood clotting, just to name a few. Um, and despite a massive global effort in research, I think it's safe to say that we still don't fully understand the molecular, cellular, and physiological processes that drive the different pathologies of serving COVID-19. What exactly causes that damage to the lung, the heart, and the other organs? How could these mechanisms be modulated in the clinic to decrease the impact of COVID-19 pathologies? Identifying these mechanisms would, of course, enable a better approach in the clinic. Um, so our motto is that given the massive phenotypic variability, nothing in the study of COVID-19 makes sense except under the light of precision personalized medicine. Massive phenotypic variability, in order to make a difference, we need to understand how that phenotypic variability is accompanied or matched by differences, variability in the endotype. So we need to look at the DNA, the RNA, the proteins, the metabolites, uh, all kinds of uh, metrics of the endotype to start making sense of what's happening in the clinic. So 
With that being said, then we decided to complete an integrated analysis of thousands of molecular cell and physiological processes in hospitalized COVID-19 patients versus non-infected controls. And then to create a data ecosystem for accelerated hypothesis testing and data analysis by a wide range of scientists, physicians, and even the lay public at large. So to achieve this, we focus on high quality samples, 109 um, unique participants, 37 of them uh, COVID negative, 72 COVID positive, slightly more um, males than females as it is common in the hospital uh, for COVID-19. 21 under 21 years old, 88 over 21 years old, and a few of them sampled twice. Okay, so this is, the, the, again, only a fraction of what the bank has, but high quality samples. And then we did everything we could. Uh, these, these samples were um, procured either from UCH or from CHCO, and then clinical data has been uh, captured through the health data compass, TEL has been in the sector. From that blood draw, early on, we uh, convinced the biobank that they should be collecting Pax gene RNA tubes so that we could do whole blood transcriptome. So we did. From the plasma, we did two different proteomics platforms, a soma scan assay measuring more than 5,000 epitopes, matching more than 3,000 proteins. And then Kirk did mass spectrometry for about 400, 400 plus abundant um, plasma proteins. Then we did deep cytokine, cytokine profiling, 82 different cytokines with MSD assays. Then we did seroconversion assays with a new um, MSD assay that MSD provided in kind. Then Angelo took both uh, the plasma and the red blood cells and they, he completed tons of metabolomics and epidemics analysis. And then Elena took the PBMCs uh, from a different adequate and ran mass cytometry to map hundreds of immune cell subsets. So then each of the experts then uh, produced that data, curated it, uh, analyzed it uh, to a degree, and then all those expertly curated data sets were ingested into the data coordinating center uh, for multiple purposes. One of them is to right away start collaborative expert analysis, but also to create a files, analysis ready files that would feed the code on expert that we'll share with you in a moment. So the data, through the data coordinating center, we're hoping to um, embark on collaborative uh, expert analysis and through the COVID on Explorer to have crowdsourced analysis at the global scale. Hopefully a combination of these two uh, will lead to discoveries. So how do you play the COVID? The, the beauty of this integrated multi-omics data sets where all the data comes from the exact same samples enables a fully holistic synergistic set of analysis where you can enter the COVID through any of these individual data sets with a hypothesis in mind or with no hypothesis in mind, just simply exploring any one data set and then mine all the other data sets um, to find um, uh, answers to your uh, scientific questions. And I'm gonna give you just one example in the next 10 minutes or so to illustrate how this works. Uh, we're gonna be using the zero conversion assays as an entry point to ask, what are the impacts of zero conversion in hospitalized COVID-19 patients? So that, that was just one example of the kinds of things that can be done when you do things the way we did them, where you collect all the data from the exact same samples. You can do this amazing cross-platform investigation. So now anybody can do this because all the data that I should show you now is publicly available in a user-friendly format. So I'm going to get out now of my um, PowerPoint and stop sharing that so that I can share my browser. Um, and I go, don't worry, I mean, I'm going to give you the, the URL for this. So this is a live website, uh, the so-called COVID on Explorer, that has all the data types that we generated that have been loaded here. So I'm going to go ahead and start loading these various dashboards. Uh, it's going to take a minute. We're talking about a ton of data here. I'm going to click into each one of those and let's spend the next five, 10 minutes doing a little uh, demo. And don't worry, we'll have tons of, of uh, sessions to train uh, interested individuals on how to use um, the COVID on Explorer. So all the dashboards are organized in the same fashion. So once you understand how to use one dashboard, you know how to use the other dashboards. So um, 
All the dashboards have a, an overview tab and an effect of COVID-19 status tab. So the overview is a very simple blur, um, uh, sharing basically what you see that we've done, but there are some important files that are stored here. Uh, for example, the names of all the features that uh, you'll be able to investigate. For example, this is a PDF file with all the MSD cytokines that we're measuring the actual uh, official gene name. Uh, if you are here in the Proteome, you can you know, download here, for example, all the SOMA mesh used by the SOMA scan to measure uh, you know, 5,000 proteins, you know, multiple um, pages in that PDF. Or you can come back here and find all the proteins that Kirk measure with uh, mass spec, and you can find the Swiss per IDs, so on and so forth. So the, please do read the overviews. The overviews um, have important information, and we're going to be uploading more and more uh, protocols and all the important accessory files there. So let me show you how uh, one of the dashboards works, and then we'll maybe repeat some of the exercises on the on the other dashboard. All the dashboards are organized the same way. Again, once you know how to use one, you can use the other ones. So every dashboard has um, a little tutorial where um, you can see that in order to render the volcano plot and the box and whisker plots, you have to set up your options. So you have to set your platform in the cytokines dashboard. There's only one platform platform at this point, MSD. In other, in other dashboards, there are more than, there's more than one platform. Uh, you get to choose your statistical test. It would be good for you to learn a little bit about this and how they are similar to this. You get to choose your adjustment method. You want to do bomb Ferroni, you want to do FDI. Um, you get to choose whether you want to look at the entire cohort, just only one of the sexes, and also whether you want to look at everybody or just uh, the adult, okay? And then you can select your feature in the cytokine dashboard. The feature is cytokine, of course. And then even if you don't select, you get to apply a filter and generate a plot. So now, um, there it is, 82 cytokines, measuring 109 samples at your fingertips. Now you can play. Can come out here and be like, okay, what is this? It's something called CXCL10 has a fold change of 5.74 and a p value of 4 to the minus 5. Okay, and this is the box and whiskey plot that goes with that. And you can see log 2 transform, or you can see non log 2 transform. That's pretty cool. Right? And you can hop over here and you can see there are all their cytokines that are elevated in COVID 19, something called IL10. Something called CXCL11 makes you wonder whether it's related to CXCL10. And then, so you can do that now since you are now exploring uh, in an unbiased fashion, you didn't come here to look for any particular cytokine, at least I didn't just now. Maybe it would be a good idea to turn on the penalty piece for multiple hypothesis correction. So now all of my p values have dropped. And that's now my, my cutoff there for a p of 0.05. Uh, but CXCL10 and CXCL11 still remain significant after having done an FDR10 adjustment. Now, all the dashboards have um, a, an entry to the to the back end uh, where you can look at the data. So this is, if you're familiar with how to use an Excel spreadsheet, uh, this is very similar. You can filter uh, your features by fault change. You can filter by p-value. So you want to look at only the features that are at p0.05 or 0.01. Once you see one, one, you know, the, the more stringent you are, the fewer the factors uh, that will make it there. Uh, maybe you want to look at all of them, and then you can download this data. You can copy this data to your pick board, download a, a CSV file, an Excel file, PDF print. You can change column visibility. So I'm going to go right on and download for $5,000 worth of MSD into my computer. I just did that. I don't know that. Should I try that again? Let me do that again. There you go. Again, I should do it again. Great. So now I can open that Excel spreadsheet in my computer and play. Let me go back here to um, the MSD plot. Now, I never heard of CXCL10. Well, actually, that's a lie. I know exactly what CXCL10 is. But imagine that you never did. You can come here and read every paper uh, ever written on CXCL10. I had to unblock my, my pop-up blockage. There you go. Now you're in PubMed reading every paper ever published on CXCL10. Maybe you're a big fan of gene cards. Great, there you go. Now you can go and read about uh, CXCL10 in gene cards. Maybe you are a member of the um, um, late audience and you know, they're used to Wikipedia, great. So now you click on there and you get to read about every um, uh, community uh, contributed information on CXCL10, great. So very easy to do research. Once you find something that catches your eye, you can get out of the COVID-19 Explorer and uh, do research. 
Let me show you just one more feature before I illustrate a couple of things about the, the dashboards. It's a, a cool new feature that we um, introduced where you can select groups of data. So you, for example, I can select this group that is high for CX filter. You notice now I have something called group A. And now I can select something that is called group B, which is low for CX filter. So I have group A, group B. I come down here and I can compare those two groups based on another feature. Now, I just noticed, you probably noticed that there was something called CXC L11 that is also elevating COVID-19. So now I'm asking, well, the two groups that are high and low for CXC L10, how are they in terms of CXC L11? Well, they're also significantly different. It makes you wonder if CXC L11 or CXC L10 are related. And in fact, they are. CXC L10 is the interferon inducible protein 10, and CXC L11 is the interferon inducible protein 9. Great, so they're both induced by interference and one goes up, the other one goes up as well. But that's not true for everything, right? We can other side, we got, you know, this particular side, you can CX3, CO1, fractal kind. Not really different uh, in these two groups that are different by CX Hilton. So I guess we're doing research. So you can click on these uh, uh, picture icons and if I hit on that, I'm gonna get a PDF and then I can put on my grant proposal to NIH asking to, um, for money to study CX Hilton. Let's see, actually, even I can also download that image over here. So very briefly, I want to show you a couple of things uh, from the Proteum. Actually, I already had it downloaded. That there are two alternative platforms. So you can use mass spectrometry or soma scan, and uh, you can choose which type of proteomic you're looking at. And then again, let's see, is it true that CXCL11, CXCL11, Take a minute, it's running our, our KS test on 5,000 epitopes. Oh, wow, yeah, CXC11 also elevated in the SOMASCAN platform. Hey, I wanna download all this data to my computer team. Sorry, this is pretty, has 5,000 rows. There you go, $65,000 worth of SOMASCAN data just downloaded into my computer. I wanna show you something about the Metabolome very quickly. Um, the two platforms that Angelo created, the plasma and the red blood cells. I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the plasma. I just learned that there are a couple uh, interfering inducible cytokines that are um, elevated in COVID-19. So I'm looking at this metabolites and, oh wow, kinorenin. I read a paper saying that kinorenin is interfering inducible. I wonder if that's true only in the plasma or also in the red blood cells. I'm gonna go ahead and change platforms. Kapoom, kinorenin, also induced in the red blood cells. Hey, Angelo, do you mind if I download tens of thousands of metabolomics, metabolomics data to my computer? There you go, Kapoom. Thank you, Angelo, you're the best. Great. Lastly, there's one cool trick I wanna show you here in the immune maps um, dashboard where uh, Elena has set up different menus, different lineages. You can look at frequencies among all life cells such as T cells or CDA or CD. 40 cells, all B cells, all monocytes, myeloid, uh, dendritic cells. So we're gonna select all live cells and that's gonna be my frequencies of different subsets within live cells and they're at the top of the chart. Wow, keep, you know, Joaquin was not lying. Plasma blasts are up in COVID-19. And again, you can always come here, you know, and download uh, all the data. The antibody order for the site of data set costed $40,000. Thank you, Elena. Everybody send Elena a bottle of wine. Great. So now I'm going to stop sharing this um, and come back for the last two slides of my presentation. Great. That's it. Write it down. Easy to memorize. COVIDM.org for the world to see. Use it, play with it, share it, get the word out. Several hundred thousand dollars worth of data released to the public ahead of publication. So here's my call to action to this community. Join the COVID-19 project. We need data analysts with advanced expertise by, st by statistics and bioinformatics to join the multi-omics analysis team. There are way too many discoveries for any, any group of three or four people to, to be able to, to deliver. Uh, and we don't want you know, people who are casually interested in spending a few hours you know, a week. No, we need, People who, whose PIs, 
would uh, let them join the Covenant team and get a couple of papers out analyzing this multidimensional data set. We want domain experts to join our weekly COVID meetings to discuss ideas and results. We meet every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Uh, uh, we're gonna be making the, the Zoom link accessible to the website. And also, we want you to give your data back to the COVID Explorer. If you got samples from the COVID-19 biobank, why couldn't you give it back to the COVID-19 Explorer? If the COVID-19 team can do this, so can you. Um, and that is the end of my presentation, Tom. And I'll be happy to take um, questions and criticisms. Hopefully we have time. It seems like we do have time for that. I'm gonna turn on my camera so that this is a bit you more precious. You know. Look at that. Joaquin, thanks for that great presentation and the uh, walkthrough. It's fun to, fun to see the uh, way that can be utilized by people. So it looks like there were a few questions in that Q&A box at the bottom. Joaquin, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can read them too if you'd like. Why don't I read them and then you can think as I read them. How's that? Yeah, I, I like this question. So, um, Kevin, um, Kevin has a question about uh, clot in COVID being associated with antiphospholipid and tumor development. Any plans to test that? Um, no, but we probably should. Uh, we we don't have antiphospholipid and tumor development. No, we have not measured those. So, Kevin, I would. Um, I would follow up with you and learn more about you. Jessica, are these results adjusted for co-founders age six adults versus pediatric? So in the, uh, that's a good in the COVID on Explorer, uh, you are not adjusting for the thing. So you have to be mindful of that, that when you run a, a KS test or um, when you run a um, um, will consult test, you're not adjusting for that. So we're looking into being able to give you an option to run a linear model and select for your covariates as part of the analytical tools. Now, in the paper that I've been telling you about, everything is being properly adjusted, right? We're not using just a straight, a straight um, data. Uh, will the raw data behind the Explorer, this is uh, Vladimir, will the raw data behind the Explorer available outside of the web application context? Yes, will be. Uh, we're uploading right now all the data sets to the appropriate biorepositories, the RNA seq to the um, uh, dbGaP, uh, um, the um, mass cytometry data to import or whatever Elena's favorite things. And we'll be, as those data sets become online, we'll be providing links in the overview. So you can go and find the right dbGaP entry or the right gene expression omnibus entry, so on and so forth. Uh, James Flynn, Great, James Flynn uh, has accepted the invitation to work together. Um, an anonymous attendee, do you have a hypothesis about why interferon production decreases in stage two? And I would assume that, that you know, the, the virus now is being uh, somewhat controlled by the development of the humoral immunity. And, and now maybe the virus is now hiding inside in endothelial cells and other funny places, but, but no longer uh, triggering that very obvious interferon response. Uh, so I would like to think that what we're looking at is a transition from, from you know, an early innate immune response to an adaptive response mediated by the antibodies. Um, Melissa Hende, oh, good to see you here, Melissa. Are the plans for the institutions to contribute data or otherwise federate? Absolutely. Everybody send me your data. We'll put on the COVID-19 story. So Melissa, if you know of anybody who has tons of data and they are open to... Um, um, to um, open science, you know, crowdsource analysis, we, we are game. We set up the platform with our own data. We'd love to get all these people data in there. Can you link clinical outcomes to the data you're collecting? Uh, for example, predictors of high diamond protein. Yes, so the, the, the version that you're seeing of the Explorer is the version that, that 1.0, that is live today. We wanted to get you something now. We wish we could have done it three months ago. Uh, but then uh, we would like to um, start adding new tabs, you know, just, not just impact of COVID-19, but impact of zero conversion, impact of high dimer, impact of whatever they think about it. But I have more dashboards for you to uh, ask these kind of questions. Uh, Patricia, would you send me that uh, longitudinal study uh, by email? Patricia, hey, I want to read that. I'm, I'm imagining it's related to uh, what we presented today. Paul, good to see you, Paul, here. Any plans for linking to other clinical data? Uh, yes. So we now have information on comorbidities, but 
Well, I, I should tell you that we have only 70 something COVID positive patients. I don't think we're, we're well powered uh, to do the type of analysis that you're saying. Now, if we have 500 samples, right? If we had done the COVID among 500 samples and we want to, uh, then we would be well powered to say, hey, Hispanic versus not Hispanic or by B, rank stratified by BMI or with or without diabetes. Um, we have that information. You're welcome to join us every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. for the, for the COVID-19. I'm concerned that we may not have great power to look at this subgrouping. Um, Patricia, is it possible to connect the data to a specific sample population? I think this is related. This might be related. Oh, yeah, maybe Patricia is asking about sample level, sample level information. Sample level information will be available, not the clinical data, but the, but the omics when in the files that you will find in the BGAP GEO import. The data that you're downloading now from Explore is the aggregated data feeding those volcano plots and those and those uh, box and whiskey plots. At this point, the COVID on Explore is not going to give you sample level, personal level information. Okay. Good, all great questions. I mean, I'll just throw this comment. Uh, we really focused on these perspectives. Remember, in the COVID biobank, we've got two groups. We've got the perspective, which was done here. Again, we've we able to add, we're able to process those kind of real times that come in. You know, for if, if you were interested to Joaquin's point about a relatively small sample size, if you want to look at patients with diabetes or obesity, you, there might be a lot of retrospective samples. So if your work could be done on that data set, there could be lots of samples. But I think we're, we were right. And we're actively working to have additional patients uh, go on to the covid owned biobank, um, which then tends to be used for this. I would say, you know, two months ago, things are pretty slow. We weren't getting really any accruals. So we're now ramping up. We're trying to get some additional patients that are, for example, acutely ill in the ICU. Almost all these patients have been consented really on the floors or just getting admitted, that sort of thing. Uh, we're also trying to, we're also working with Kevin Dean, I think was on here and Elena and others to uh, have some healthcare worker information. That data will come over into the biobank uh, and could be used to get, to get some additional patients from the floors. But again, I think to Joaquin's point, to get the hundreds of patients you might need for some of that would be difficult. The prospective sample, the retrospective might be an option, depending on what you want to do. Correct, correct. Yes, thank you, Tom, for clarifying that. We do have thousands, hundreds of thousands of the remnants uh, that can power some of these inquiries. And guys, there was just a, a note in chat from Amanda Hill that wanted to share the email address of covidome at ucdenver.edu. Great, you wanna put that in the chat? Go yeah, it, it is. it's in the chat and I'll make sure it's shared with um, all the participants, just one. Yeah, and also, um... Uh, we'll be putting it, use the website. So I didn't, I didn't show you, let me, let me show you that again. Um, that um, is the browser now. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my browser. Uh, the, we have a website, the COVID-19 expert has a landing, a so-called landing page uh, with a ton of information, here it is. A ton of information um, about the project and, and that's how you're gonna be able to contact us. Where is that? You see here? Yeah, there it is. Tom, can you see the landing page for the COVID on project? Yeah, great. So again, if you go to covidon.org, it will get you exactly here. Covidon.org. I hit that, it gets you to this funny page. And that, what I showed you today, the COVID on Explorer is that link over there, but you can learn about us and then and then what Amanda um what Amanda uh, provided is basically the same as, as you will find in this contact us link within the webpage. And it looks like there's another question coming through the Q&A. How can we participate in your Wednesday COVID meetings? Um, we'll, we'll post a Zoom link. Let's make that a national item, Amanda and, and, and the expert team. We'll put um, a link in the website. Um, I can give you right now, since we are here, let me give you the thing. So make right now in the chat. Um, so everybody has it, but we'll make sure to announce this. Um, yeah, so we're prominent. There you go. That's a Zoom link to our weekly meeting every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. 
And I, I'm not sure if you saw the new question come in from James Flynn. What is your vision for transcriptomics? Uh, we have done the, the whole blood. I didn't play with that, um, with that dashboard, but you, you're welcome to go play. It's organized the same as the others. Um, and we have an entire story built around the transcriptomics and interference scores developed from the transcriptomics. At this point, um, um, we're not generating any, any more transcriptome data. Um, I, if anybody got samples PVMCs to do single cell RNA seq or or to do transcriptome on a purified immune cell test, we'd we'll love to talk to you. We'd we'll love to um, um, uh, integrate that into the COVID -Dome Explorer. If you go to the to the Trisome Explorer very briefly, I'm going to go there. Um, you will see that uh, we have multiple transcriptomes, not not just one. So if you go here to the Try some explode and you go to the transcriptome. Uh, you will see that we are, can, not, can not only do whole blood transcriptome, but also look at uh, specific uh, immune cell types. So if I pick a gene here in codon chromosome 21, uh, you will see, I believe, five or six different cell types showing up in a moment. Takes a minute. There you go. You know, so, so we can do multiple transcriptomes and we have the, the capacity to have more than one transcriptome with the COVID and exploder. We're not there at this point yet. Well, got through a lot of questions there. It's about uh, three minutes, four minutes to the top of the hour. Maybe just do a, a last call for questions in the Q&A box there. That's worked pretty well. Well, can you, I was struck as I listened to you talk and watched the presentation, just what a, a tremendous number of people, as you pointed out better than I did, came together both for the collection of samples, but then for the analysis and then for the fun of Michael Miller's team putting this up and so forth. So I think I'd like to end with my final comments and I'll flip with you just by thanking all the many people have been involved. Obviously the patients in the midst of everything going on have stopped, listened to a consent and spent time to allow us to do that. Joaquin, yeah. do you have any closing comments you'd like yeah. to make? It's just tons of gratitude, Tom. tons of gratitude. You know, we, we back in March when, when we were being uh, shut down, you know, a few of us grabbed the axe and went into the burning building and, and, and called for the people to join. And a lot of people joined. All those individuals in the COVID-19, you know, uh, again, they don't have an NIH grant to be doing COVID-19 research, but they say, yes, Joaquin, we want to play. And yes, we buy into this model of open science and, you know, collaborative analysis. Um, just, just, you know, a sort of a cultural revolution, if you will, you know, to, to see that people are willing and able to do this type, this type of effort, you know, and it makes you wonder after COVID-19, what, what else could we do, you know, uh, with this paradigm, right? What, what else could we tackle um, without, without the time pressure of a, of a pandemic that is decimating the population? Tons of gratitude to you, Tom, and, and the COVID-19 members. In the last couple of minutes, looks like there's a few more questions. Um, Pete Morani asks, will you be doing any omics on respiratory samples? Uh, we'd love to, we'd love to. Uh, we haven't gotten to, to them yet. It's, I don't know who, who has them, if the bank has them or there's another team that has them, reach out to us. We may be able to scrap some funding to, to look at those samples as well. Uh, Paul McLean just wants to say a fantastic effort by everyone. Um, Tyler Smith, a question, how would you explain the practical importance of the project to the general public? Well, I would, I would say that this is uh, an effort to fast track and accelerate a precision medicine approach to COVID-19. The public needs to understand that COVID-19 is not one, one entity. COVID-19 manifests very, very different in every individual. And in order for us to make a difference in the clinic, we need to understand how COVID-19 is affecting different people. It affects the young and the old differently, males and females differently, probably there are different ethnic, ethnic uh, variations of how we manifest. So what the COVID on that is tries to accelerate, fast track, a precision medicine approach to COVID-19 research and clean care. Well, with that, uh, perhaps we should call it a wrap. Um, I, again, Joaquin, I want to again thank you for all of your efforts, your leadership, to all those who have been involved in this effort, some of whom we've mentioned and some of whom we've, for we've probably forgotten, the participants, those that have allowed us to the research community, I think there's a there's a general hope and desire that this is greatly beneficial to you, that this will energize and accelerate your research. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. With that, we'll say thank you. Have a good day. Thanks very much for joining.